Jane, it's your turn. Epigenética. Un aplauso, por favor. Go ahead. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here, and particularly to be in the company of so many other exciting scholars and speakers. What I thought I'd do with my little sliver of time is to expand on what both Dalton and Jeffrey have shared with us and talk a bit about the environment. And specifically, I want to talk about the social connections and significant life events and experiences which form it. But before I delve into that, what I would like to do is start with a story. In 1976, the year that Apple Computing was formed, and Nadia Comaneci earned the first perfect 10 in Olympic gymnastics. Across the ocean in Tangshan, China, a million people lay sleeping on what seemed like a perfectly ordinary summer evening. They had no idea that as they slept, the earth had quite literally begun to crack, crack apart beneath them. Well, if that was a typo, to crack apart beneath them. Um, a quarter of the population would not survive this cataclysmic earthquake. An 8.2 on the Richter scale, it was one of the most devastating natural disasters of the 20th century. Of those who did survive, 93% would be left homeless, and just one road, one road, within this previously functional and unspoiled city would be left usable. Surviving Tangshan, or Hurricane Katrina, or the Indian Ocean tsunami, or any one of the other number of seemingly endless natural disasters which shred our planet is a pivotal experience. The question is not, will it mark you? It's not even, how much will it mark you? It's why it does. Now, 18 years after Tang Shan, about 1,200 teenagers in the city were interviewed, and they had the opportunity to share a number of different things. They talked about their relationships with friends and family members, how they viewed the world. They talked about really ordinary things like what it felt like to get up in the morning or what their grades were. And they talked about significant things like their goals and their aspirations for their future. And something very profound shook out of those interviews. It turned out that for some of these children, and this will be reminiscent of what Dalton shared with us, the earthquake mattered quite a lot, even if they weren't yet born. So half of the teenagers in Tangshan were actually in utero during the earthquake. And compared to teenagers who were just one year apart in age, who were otherwise so similar to them, those who were in utero and had experienced the earthquake from only within their mother's wombs had profound difficulties growing up, and particularly as they navigated this transition from adolescence into early adulthood. They had significantly higher rates of depression. They expressed thoughts of suicide. They felt very hopeless about their futures, and they felt helpless when they were offered new strains and challenges in life. Now, to be clear, all of the teens in Tang Shan had grown up in the aftermath of the quake. All of them had grown up in a world which was marked by loss and reconstruction. They'd all been nurtured by the residents of a grieving city. But those who were in utero seemed to have suffered the most. Now, these findings about the teenagers in Tang Shan mesh very closely with what we know of other studies of prenatal stress. We know that children who are in utero, whose fathers die while they are still in utero, grow up to have significantly increased rates of depression compared to children whose fathers pass away during their first year of life. We know that those who were in utero during the 1940 German invasion of the Netherlands grew up to have disproportionately high rates of schizophrenia and other psychological disorders. And that means we get the opportunity to learn. We can learn from Tangshan and Haiti and Japan and Hurricane Katrina and even 9-11 in the US, all of the places where the tragic and the unexpected have occurred. We learn what I think is a fairly simple but also fairly staggering truth, which is that the environment we encounter before birth will resonate with us through the rest of our lives. It does this because it's the very first environment we encounter and it becomes a blueprint for the way we respond to future strains and challenges. Now, the counterpart to the environment, as Jeffrey shared with us, is, of course, genetics. And one of the things that we've begun to figure out is that it's never an either-or situation. It's never just nature or just nurture. 
And that's because it's actually the environment which determines how much of our genes for any given trait will be expressed. This is what's known as gene by environment interaction, sometimes called G by E. And we see examples of it all the time. It's all throughout our world. We see that boys who are exposed to physical abuse, violence, and aggression early in life are more likely to grow up to become physically abusive, violent, and aggressive adults if they have a particular variant of a gene known as MAOA, which is responsible for emotion regulation. But if they don't have that gene, even if they're exposed to the violence, we don't see the same outcomes. And conversely, I haven't been genotyped. I don't know what my MAOA uh, variant looks like. But people who might have this risky variant, even if they're exposed to violence and abuse, aren't necessarily, even if they're not, oh, sorry, people who have this risky variant, if they're not exposed to violence and abuse, aren't necessarily going to follow that trajectory. It's the environmental circumstances which determine it. We know that genes also play a larger role in our um, tendencies towards addiction and alcoholism and substance abuse when people grow up in urban rather than rural environments. And we also know that genes for good things, things like intellectual giftedness and creativity, are almost entirely suppressed when people grow up in severely impoverished circumstances, but they're allowed to develop naturally in more affluent ones. What this means is that the environment has a lot of power. It can either quash or enhance either our biological assets or our biological drawbacks. And we all have a collection of both. I'm a clinical psychologist, so I tend to be very drawn to domains like depression or anxiety. But this pattern actually holds true for a lot of different things, including medical diseases and cancers, as well as the assets and skills we most want to see flourish, things like musicality and artistry, scientific acumen, compassion, and resiliency. And lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about something known as epigenetics. It turns out that the environment determines not just how much of our genes are expressed, but whether that particular expression is actually passed on to the next generation. So as our DNA replicates, it sometimes attracts little extra molecules, extra molecules of hydrogen and oxygen that just sort of slap themselves onto your DNA at various points in the genetic code. These molecules are known as methyl groups, and they actually have the potential to determine whether a given gene is active or inactive. Is a given gene going to be on or off in our lifetime? I tend to think of them as sort of like padlocks. They hang out on our DNA. They never change the genetic code itself. The genetic code will be passed on to our children. But just like a padlock on a door, these methyl groups have the power to determine whether a particular gene is active or inactive, whether a door can be opened or closed. How functional is that given door? The simple fact is that some very profound life experiences, things like starvation, trauma, abuse, or even more benign or commonplace ones like smoking, have the power to promote methylation and alter gene expression in a way that's very persistent over time. And that inherited, that methylation, that new way that the gene is expressed, can actually be passed on to subsequent generations. What this means is that someone whose parent or grandparent experienced a famine will be more likely to have a lower body weight and less prone to weight-related conditions like diabetes or obesity than someone whose parent or grandparent did not experience a famine. Someone whose parent or grandparent smoked will inherit the methylation patterns which are consistent of smoking, even if they themselves never picked up a cigarette, and they will be at increased risk for respiratory difficulties and asthma. We see that people who, are exp who experience very profound traumas very early on in childhood show pronounced methylation in the gene regions which are associated with emotion regulation and stability. We've long looked at social explanations, but epigenetics offers a biological explanation for the increased susceptibility to depression, anxiety, and even post-traumatic stress disorder in these people's non-traumatized children. What this means is that none of us are ever really born with a blank slate. 
We inherit the environment and the experiences which go along with it. They ricochet through the generations at a deep cellular level, and they have the power to influence how and why we act, think, and feel the way that we do. So thank you for your time, and thank oh. you. <laughs>